how did one man, Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, know that America would be willing to wait in line to spend $3.50 for a cup of coffee? Did Fred Smith, the founder of Federal Express, dream up the concept in a moment of brilliance? Or did it take longer than that? Did Thomas Edison come up with the idea for the light bulb from a dream? Or did he actually observe something and create a smaller, more effective version of it? How did turning things upside down lead to the discovery of new opportunities like the GPS? What is value and how do you know it when you see it? If we listen to customers, will they tell us what we need to know? or will they give us short-sighted answers that curb our creativity? Do entrepreneurial opportunities materialize themselves to only a lucky few through a moment of inspiration? Or are there patterns to discovering opportunities? And if there are patterns, can we learn from them and use them? Entrepreneurs have been spotting opportunities for a very long time. Their stories of inspiration and vision and tenacity fill the pages of entrepreneurial textbooks and images. But what we don't often look at is the sequence of events that lead up to these opportunities being identified. And if we actually spend time looking at them, we'll see patterns. And these patterns are broken down into a series of predictable ways that many entrepreneurs actually have discovered their opportunities. We will be discussing six different ways that entrepreneurs discover opportunities. And the patterns we will show you have actually been used not only in more recent years, but through the last hundred years as some of the most famous entrepreneurs have discovered amazing opportunities. One of the most popular ways of spotting opportunities is a method called better, faster, cheaper, smaller. That is, looking at an existing innovation and trying to identify ways that you can improve upon it in some significant way, whether that's making it smaller, more powerful, more affordable. In technology entrepreneurship, we see this happening time and time again, where new innovations in technology will disrupt existing solutions. Think of mainframe computers replaced by mini computers, mini computers replaced by desktops and laptops, and now being replaced by tablets and phones. In technology entrepreneurship, this is a matter of course that happens again and again and again. Some of the most famous entrepreneurs follow the same process. In fact, Thomas Edison, one of the most famous entrepreneurs, used this to develop several of his inventions. And we think of the photograph, we think of motion pictures, but one of the most powerful inventions of Thomas Edison's followed this process specifically, the light bulb. Thomas Edison was an amazing entrepreneur. His work on the light bulb is cited as a work of tenacity and vision that is cited in many entrepreneurial stories. Thomas Edison once quoted as saying, I didn't fail a thousand times trying to find the right filament for the incandescent bulb. I actually discovered a thousand ways not to create the light bulb. In 1879, he finally succeeded. But how did he originally spot the opportunity? To answer that, we have to start 70 years earlier. In 1809, 40 years before Thomas Edison was even born, an English chemist, Humphrey Davy, actually created the first incandescent electrical light source using two charcoal strips. In effect, the arc lamp was born. It wasn't until the 1850s that attempts were even made to commercialize the arc lamp. However, there really wasn't a reliable source of electricity. It took until the 1870s when a reliable electrical source was available that electrical art lamps, arc lamps actually started appearing on the street corners of the United States. 70 years of groundwork had been laid in preparation for the next opportunity. Finally, in 1878, at the Paris World Fair, an event was scheduled. They were going to turn on the street lamps at night. Spectators from all over the world, innovators, entrepreneurs who had gathered to show their inventions at the Paris World Fair, gathered on the street to witness the event. At the right moment, they threw the switch and light bulbs 200 times the brightness of modern today's lights lit up the streets. The moment was amazing and inspired everyone in the audience. In that audience was a young innovator named Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison attended this fair in 1878 to show off his megaphone and photograph inventions. And it was there he observed these large electric street lamps or arc lamps and became inspired. In fact, vowed that he would create a smaller, more effective version. 
And after many months of hard work, he succeeded. He created an incandescent bulb that would burn for 13 and a half hours. Thomas Edison's story of tenacity and vision are great examples of entrepreneurial success. And his focus on creating a smaller, faster, cheaper solution was a great opportunity. One great example of this is in the story of Starbucks and how one man, Howard Schultz, observed patterns and value being created in one location and was able to transfer it to another location. Now you have to remember, Howard Schultz wasn't the founder of Starbucks. Starbucks was founded in 1971 by three individuals, a English teacher, um, Jerry Baldwin, a history professor, Zeev Siegel, and a writer, Gordon Bacher. These three individuals founded Starbucks in 1971 in Seattle with a passion for selling coffee beans and coffee makers for consumers who wanted to brew their own coffee at home. They never intended Starbucks to be a place where you actually buy brewed coffee, espressos, and lattes. In fact, the idea was something they were very much against. At the same time, across the country in New York, a young Howard Schultz was working as a general manager of a coffee, a drip coffee manufacturer and was reviewing his sales numbers one day and noticed a pattern. In the data he saw, an unknown store in Seattle was ordering more coffee pots than Macy's. Think about that. A small unheard of store ordering more coffee makers than one of the largest retailers in the country. Howard Schultz noticed this pattern and had to find out why. In going to Seattle, visiting the Starbucks Pike's Place store, he fell in love with the idea of, of coffee beans and how you would actually use that in order to provide customers a new product. And very shortly after that became their director of marketing. He saw a pattern that was out of phase and acted. There's a second experience that happened in Starbucks several years later. Howard Schultz was sent on an assignment to Milan, Italy to actually attend a show um, that where many people who were manufacturing coffee makers and drip coffee makers were showing their products. And this was a discovery trip for him to learn more about products they could sell in the store. It was during this trip to Milan that Howard Schultz happened to go into a Milan espresso, espresso shop. And in that, he saw for the first time an atmosphere where people were purchasing uh, espressos, the barista was engaging the customers, there was a lot of deep conversations, and a whole experience for him opened up in the way coffee could be bought and sold. But that was just one experience. Throughout the day, Howard Schultz actually visited several espresso bars, and the same pattern kept emerging. What he saw was the value being created in this one location, and thought about, could this value be transported to Seattle? And the rest is history. Howard Schultz came back to Seattle and eventually introduced the modern day espresso bar that we now see in the United States. And that aspect of noticing patterns, patterns that are out of phase, and value that is in one location that could be transported to another location, are great ways to spot opportunities. One way people find opportunities is by observing patterns and transferring value from one location to another. In fact, we're, as a, as a society and humans, we love watching patterns. And tracking patterns is something that we're very good at. Um, but what's interesting is that sometimes there are patterns of things that are slightly out of phase, slightly different, that entrepreneurs will notice and detect those patterns will lead to amazing opportunities. Additionally, seeing value created in one place and the pattern of that value and transferring that value to another location is another thing that entrepreneurs do quite well. This observing patterns, transferring value from one location to another is something that many entrepreneurs find is a great way to spot opportunities. Not all ideas are spotted. Some are created or born. But that doesn't do it justice. Because the truth is, many amazing ideas started many years before any of us ever find out about them. And they evolved over a, series of, a period of time. We call this evolving vision a tremendous way that opportunities are spotted and developed. 
whether it's the iPad, which is an amazing mobile technology platform, or the internet itself. Both these technologies were conceived of many, many years before it actually came to market. The internet, originally conceived in 1950 as a peer-to-peer -peer protocol between computers, took 45 years until it eventually evolved into the modern commercial internet. This aspect, this aspect of idea evolution is very common, but something that we don't often pay attention to. But you can see it in amazing fam famous stories, such as Federal Express. The Federal Express story is a great example of an evolving vision over time. Fred Smith, the founder of FedEx, actually was an amateur pilot. And as a teenager, he learned to fly. But in 1962, at Yale University, he is now credited with a famous paper he wrote in an economics class about a future computerized society where computerized transactions would automate life for everyone. And people talk about that moment as the moment which Federal Express was born from. But what people don't realize is there's a lot more to it than that. At the same time, Fred Smith, who was already an amateur pilot, was attending Yale. He was also a charter flight uh, captain, uh, moving people from place to place on private jets or private airplanes. And it was actually the people he was moving that was rather interesting. He was moving computer and technology executives who were trying to solve logistic problems with broken computer parts. So this is part of what was happening in Fred's life when he wrote that paper. After Yale, from 1966 into 1970 or 69, Fred Smith actually went to Vietnam and was a platoon leader in the Vietnam War. And it was during these years that he observed logistic challenges that the military was having, moving supplies and equipment through air and ground. It gave him keen insights to some of the challenges that exist in managing logistics in a, on a large scale. It was after this, a youth as a pilot, a charter flight captain, his time at Yale, seeing computer technicians having to resolve issues with logistics on ground and air as a charter flight captain, and the military logistic management he saw that all went into the future Federal Express vision. After the Vietnam War, that's when Fred Smith finally pulled together enough of the components to launch Federal Express. This evolving vision took many years to come fruition, but it is very much a common way many entrepreneurs succeed. So another really interesting way that people discover new opportunities is through a concept we call idea inversion. And that is turning things upside down and looking at the world differently than the original path you were on. As humans, we are really good at pattern matching and some of the best entrepreneurs watch for patterns in daily activities in order to look for new opportunities for which them to, they can build, build on. But sometimes that actually boxes you in into being too constrained in your thinking. And you almost need to turn the world upside down or turn the ideas upside down and approach it from a completely different angle. And we call that idea inversion. Now what's critical about that is when you are looking at the world from a completely different perspective is to not really focus on whether your idea is possible. You really have to suspend all belief and just go with the moment. And that'll help you brainstorm and approach an idea in a completely different angle, which may yield unexpected results. So one of the, one of the really exciting examples of this uh, idea inversion is really the story of what we now know as the GPS. If you go back to 1950s, there was actually an interesting problem trying to be solved by the U.S. Navy. You see, the U.S. Navy had equipped some nuclear submarines with missile systems that would allow them to attack a country from any place on the Pacific Ocean. There was one small problem. Although the Navy was really good and has been good for hundreds of years finding the location when at sea, they couldn't do it reliably and quickly in all weather conditions. If a sub surfaces in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, it has to know immediately where it is located. At the same time this problem was happening, 
on the other side of the world in uh, John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, there were scientists working on a different problem. You have to go back to the 1950s and the Soviet Union and Cold War with the United States. In 1957, Sputnik, the first artificial satellite, was launched into orbit. And the Soviets made sure this satellite had a radio beacon that would transmit to the world that it was up there. So there were two scientists at John Hopkins Laboratory. They actually had a hypothesis that if they could use the radio beacon and track and listen for the radio beacon from Sputnik and use the Doppler effect, and with enough computing power, they theorized they could actually figure out where in the sky at any given point the Sputnik satellite was. Coincidentally, there was just such a computer invented called the UNIVAC-2. And sure enough, they were able to track the position of Sputnik anywhere it was moving across the sky from a fixed location on the ground. Frank McClure, who was the deputy director at the John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, had actually known about both problems. He knew that this, the United States Navy was trying to solve this problem of locating their subs, position on the planet, and he also then read about the report by these two scientists, William Geyer and George Weifenbach, about how to detect the location of Sputnik traveling through the sky. And he asked the two scientists, what if you invert, what if you assume the opposite? You've already written and proved that from a known location on Earth, you can track the position of a satellite tracking through the sky. What if you had a fixed location in the sky could you find yourself on Earth? So after a few days of research, William and George proved that yes, if you had a known location in, the, in orbit, you could calculate and determine where you were on Earth. Thus the creation of the fundamentals that led to the invention of the GPS device. Idea inversion, looking at the world from a different perspective, turning things upside down and suspending all beliefs led to innovations and opportunities that were never expected. There's a famous quote by Henry Ford that says, if I would have listened to the customer, I would have bred a faster horse. Well, the truth is, listening to customers is one of the most important things that entrepreneurs do. And it's finding that balance is the key to opportunities. Listening to customers is actually one of the best ways to spot opportunities. It's also one of the most difficult. Fortunately, there's been some great work written about this by Steve Blank and his customer development process that many entrepreneurs can use. The key is, as you think about talking to customers and listening to customers, is being able to separate out the process into a series of steps. First, by starting with testing for problems. You see, Testing for problems is one of the most critical things that entrepreneurs can do when they're trying to come up with an idea. Despite what we think, customers aren't sitting around waiting for us to invent solutions. They're living their lives. They're solving problems. They're actually trying to get things done. By going out and looking for what problems customers have or what needs they're trying to address, entrepreneurs can quickly identify unforeseen opportunities. Once you've tested a problem or identified a need that you feel is right for what you're trying to solve, then it's time to go back and validate that need and validate your solution with the customer. You can do that with a prototype, a paper drawing, a mock-up, a model, but it's important to go back a second time and validate what you've worked on is really solving the need of a customer. That is how great entrepreneurs do it by actually testing the solution with the customer afterwards, by validating, they actually then can confirm that the solution meets the need. And many times they're wrong, and they may find they have to try several times or pivot until they have found the right solution. But eventually, the opportunity is revealed. So identifying problems, testing your ideas and validating your solution with customers is a great iterative process 
to help you identify opportunities and navigate the tricky waters of listening to customers. It's not always what the customers say is what you need to build. Actually, far from it. It's watching what the customer does and what they do with your prototypes, for example, that help you identify whether there's really a solution and an opportunity to be had. This is a great car. Henry Ford built the Model T because he saw a need that people had that everybody wanted to have a car. And that balance of listening to customers is why he was so successful. So what is value? And why does it matter? Value is a key ingredient when you're looking for opportunities. It's also critical that entrepreneurs have the ability to identify value in either the innovation they're working on or things they're observing to come up with new opportunities. Value is often difficult for an entrepreneur because we get hung up in the things we're doing, the activities, the product we're building, and we lose sight sometimes of what the real value is. Value being, as perceived by the customer or user, and what they're giving in return for the value you're delivering. There's many examples of this, but if you're not able to identify the value, it's very difficult to innovate. Take, for example, a gas station. What is the value of a gas station? Well, many times when we talk about this concept, people get hung up in focusing on different aspects of a gas station. For example, someone might say, a gas station is about convenience. Well, there may be some truth to that, but it's also convenient for me that my chair is next to my table for my laptop. Convenience isn't by itself enough. Another response to the question about what is the value of a gas station might be, well, a gas station is where I buy fuel for my car. Close. Buying fuel is an action. Fuel is the product. But what is the value? If we have a product, there must be value. People are paying money for it. When you focus on this topic for a while, usually you come to realize the value in this scenario is that fuel provides the value of vehicle range extension. That is the value, in essence, of a gas station. We go to gas stations so our cars can go farther. Now, what's important about this is if you were to state what a gas station is and describe it in terms of what you do or what you buy, you have a very different outcome than if you state what is a gas station in terms of the value it provides. A gas station is where I buy fuel. That focuses you down a very specific path. If I were to say a gas station provides vehicle range extension, well now that refrees you up from the restraints of certain product lines, in this case fossil fuel. If a gas station is all about vehicle range extension, then wouldn't it make sense to add other products as pro vehicles are becoming more electric, such as charging stations? Because a charging station provides vehicle range extension for certain types of vehicles. This is a great way to think about the world because it also protects you from becoming obsolete in your thinking uh, and also provides ways for looking at problems with a different perspective. One more angle to this, if we focus on value of a gas station being vehicle range extending, and then we bring in a new target customer of electric vehicles, we can look at that interaction and innovate on top of that. In this case, vehicle range extension by charging actually has some limitations. It takes a long time, typically two to four hours for most average hybrid or electric vehicles. Gas stations today delivering fuel are very quick. So you could extend the value statement to say quick, efficient vehicle range extension. So how else would we solve this if you were looking to add value in vehicle range extension in electric cars. Perhaps you would look at where cars are stationary for long periods of time. Where else does that happen? Parking stations, parking lots. If you were to add vehicle range extension as a value to a parking lot, you could see a whole set of new products, products to offer. Isolating value is a critical aspect for entrepreneurs. We learned a lot about how opportunities are spotted by entrepreneurs. And although we started with this concept that many people think opportunities are presented to entrepreneurs out of the blue, 
and that people come up with the most amazing ideas in a fraction of a moment. And that only a critical few ever get to find these amazing opportunities. But as we talked about, and we look at many of the most famous entrepreneurial stories, and we look at the conditions and the moments that led up to those discoveries, you can actually start to see patterns. Patterns and techniques that anyone can adopt to spot new opportunities. Whether it's Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, and how he transplanted value from one location to another after identifying opportunities. Or Thomas Edison in his discovery of a better, cheaper, faster light bulb when electric arc lamps had been in existence for years. Or through idea inversion that can actually be used to create new ways of thinking, new ways of identifying solutions, as in the creation of the G uh, GPS device. All of these techniques are available to people to spot opportunities. It just takes looking for patterns, identifying opportunities, and not being afraid to ask why. How's it going? Good, we're, good. we're going to be out of your hair here in a few minutes. Oh, no, so. I just got to do one more, one more take of this shot.